अनुसंधान और गुजरात इंटीग्रेटेड क्लासरूम सैटेलाइट ना माध्यम थी जोड़ती कड़ी एटले संधान Good morning my dear students this lecture is part of your CC211 sem 4 students you remember this paper is history of english literature 1792 1798 to 1832 remember the romantic age you've already looked at the characteristics of the romantic age of course you have you've looked at the features of the age you have looked at some of the major writers and then of course you started looking at some of the texts and we are talking about romantic poetry you do remember two generations of romantic poets the first generation represented by wordsworth and coleridge who together published the lyrical ballads and then we talk about the second generation of romantic poets in which we have shelley and keats and byron Of course you know some of the poems written by Wordsworth you have looked at some of them in your foundation paper in the first sem you also looked at some of them in this paper when you were looking at the history of literature today i'm going to talk to you about ode to autumn who wrote it you know it was written by john keats let's look at the first slide where we come to know the years of john keats he was born in 1795 and he died in 1821 can you imagine he was dead by the time he was 26 what a tragic life it must have been to die so young at the age of 26 of a disease which in those days was fatal but not any more what we call tb or tuberculosis it was not just his ailment his illness even otherwise he had had quite a tragic life losing his parents his elder brother and sister in law migrating to australia his younger brother tom whom he nursed dying of tuberculosis being separated from his sister fanny his beloved girlfriend fanny brown walking out on him critics being highly critical and tearing to pieces the poems that he wrote and published and finally knowing that he himself was affected afflicted with the same disease which had taken away his younger brother this was the tragic life of keats this is just to give you an idea of how this poet lived but yet managed to write some of the best poems not only of the romantic age but of all ages john keats what are we looking at today we are looking at ode to autumn Before we begin talking about that let's have a quick look at John Keats look at this young man he's probably in a very thoughtful mood this is a portrait of John Keats i've already told you about his life let me tell you something about his works his first volume of verse was published in 1817 the second in 1818 the third his letters which were published posthumously do you know what that word means it means after the death of the person that means keats's letters were not published during his own lifetime remember the first volume in 1817 when he was still alive he died in 1821 the second volume in 1818 but his letters were published only after he died in his works we do see the influence of spencer as well as some other elizabethan poets 
and as I mentioned to you already, during his lifetime, he was not praised by the critics. He did not get any critical acclaim. So that was another reason for the tragic life that he led. What are the major poems that he wrote? 1. The Great Odes 2. The Sonnets 3. The Bigger Works Hyperion, Endymion, Isabella and The Eve of St. Agnes which some of you might have read. A beautiful poem about what happens to Madeline and Porphyro on that fateful night which is called The Eve of St. Agnes. Let us talk about the odes because today this lecture is about Ode to Autumn. The great odes that he wrote, there were five of them, Ode to a Nightingale, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to Melancholy, Ode to Psyche and of course Ode to Autumn. Probably the most popular of these is Ode to a Nightingale where he talks about how he wishes to fly on the wings of poesy along with the nightingale but then forlorn is the word because he is forced to come back he cannot he says imagination fancy cannot cheat as well as she is famed to do he knows that he cannot forever live in the world of imagination and therefore he has to come back to this world where youth grows pale and spectre sin and dies. The second ode is the ode on a Grecian urn where he looks at this beautiful Grecian urn. You know the Elgin marbles. Keats was very fond of art and he had seen this exhibition where he had seen this urn on which there were beautiful engravings and he writes ode on a Grecian urn. But these are just to give you some idea about what the other odes are. We will have to talk at greater length about Ode to Autumn. What are the characteristic features of the Ode as a literary form? You do remember that we have talked about different kinds, different forms of poetry. Do you remember the sonnet, the 14 lined poem? Do you remember the elegy which is written to mourn the death of someone? In the same way, you probably remember the epic, the great epics, the great Iliad or Aeneid or the English epic, Paradise Lost. You probably remember the Indian epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Well, one such form of poetry, one such literary form, one such genre is the Ode. What are the characteristic features of the Ode? Number one, it is a long lyric. It is long. Remember the sonnet is only 14 lines. Remember the couplet is only two lines. Remember the haiku is only 17 syllables. But the ode is a long poem. It, is ha it has a lyric, lyrical quality. It is a lyric. There is something musical about the ode. It has to be serious, both the subject as well as the treatment. So you cannot have a comic ode, you cannot have a funny ode. The ode has to be serious both in its theme as well as in its treatment. Since it is serious both in theme and treatment, the style also becomes elevated and it has an elaborate structure. These are the general characteristic features of an ode which Keats's odes also do have. I mentioned to you the odes of Keats. In case some of you would like to jot it down, here are the names once again for you. The Great Odes, Ode to a Nightingale, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Ode to Autumn, Ode to Psyche and Ode to Melancholy. They are different kinds of odes that Keats wrote, but they are called the Great Odes. And one critic has beautifully said, that if Keats did not write anything except the odes, if he had not written anything else except the great odes, he would still be remembered as a great poet of all ages. So great are the odes that Keats wrote. 
I'm going to talk to you about Ode to Autumn. So I thought I'll give you an idea of what the autumn looks like. This is a scene of autumn in the English countryside. Remember, in our own country, we do not have autumn like this. Autumn is Patjad or Pankad, as you might remember. But since we live in the evergreen region, we know that in our country, not all trees shed their leaves at the same time. And that is why when the asopala is shedding its leaves, the neem tree is fully green. When the neem tree is shedding its leaves, the asopala is fully green. So we do not see a sight like this. I want you to see this sight so that you can better appreciate the poem. Let us look at the poem in detail. I hope you can read the poem, my dear students, because I'm going to explain it to you line by line. This is a poem that we are going to do in detail. So please read the poem on the screen and proceed with me word by word, line by line. I want to remind you once again that Keats was a very sensuous poet. What do I mean by sensuous? He gave a great deal of importance to the senses. All of you know that we have five senses, right? The sense of sight, seeing with our eyes, hearing with our ears, smelling with our nose, tasting with our tongue and touch with our skin. So these five senses. You might have different opinions about which sense is more important or less important. But to this romantic poet, John Keats, all the senses were equally important. As I go through this poem line by line, I want you to remember once again that scene that I showed you before we began the poem. The color, the leaves, the beauty of that scene. Ode to Autumn by John Keats. He first addresses, he first talks about the season. And how does he address the season? The apostrophe, you know, a direct address. Remember your figures of speech? You're going to be doing some figures of speech, I'm sure, or you're already doing it in your paper 213. So you might remember some of the figures of speech which you have come across earlier too and which are being revised in this semester. So it's an apostrophe or a direct address. Seasons of mist and mellow fruitfulness. Remember, it is not spring when there is flowers, when the flowers begin to bloom, nor is it summer. Now it is the time when fruits begin to ripen. We need a little imagination, my dear students, to understand and appreciate this great romantic poet of England because we will have to transform ourselves from our well-known scenes to the scenes of autumn in England if we want to understand mellow fruitfulness because it seems as if all the fruits are now ready to ripen. Close bosom friend of the maturing sun you will just have to imagine a green mango and a yellow mango or a golden mango, a mango which is ready to be eaten as a fruit. How does the mango ripen? It is because of the heat. Remember, in our own Gujarat, we get the best mangoes when it is very hot. We get the best mangoes in May. And remember, when it starts raining in June, our mangoes are not so sweet. So you can well understand what he means by close bosom friend of the maturing sun. It is the sun which helps the fruits to ripen. And therefore, he calls the autumn close bosom friend of the maturing sun. Conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit. It seems as if the season autumn and the sun are friends. Not merely friends, they are conspirators because both of them have together decided how they should load and bless what? With fruit around the thatch eaves run. It is as if the sun and the season, 
the season of autumn, have together decided that they should load all the vines. What are vines, my dear students? Creepers. You know creepers. Think of the grapes. You know how the grape tree, it's not a tree. It's not a plant. It's not a bush. It's a creeper. And therefore, a creeper needs something on which it can grow. And where is it growing? You have to imagine a, 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 a scene in a village maybe where you have the thatched, you know, the roof and on which these creepers are growing. So the sun and the autumn have conspired to bend with apples the most cottage trees and fill with fruit the ripeness to the core. The core is the inside, the deep inside of the fruit. So remember when we are looking at a ripe mango, it's not just the outside of the mango which is orange. Inside the skin, you know the peel, you remove the peel, it's almost as if it has become ripe right till the inside. That is the core. Till deep inside every fruit is ripening. Who is doing it? The sun is doing it. Who is it conspiring with? It is conspiring with autumn. What is the figure of speech that you see here, my dear students? The figure of speech here is personification. Do you remember? Sajiva Ropan. What do we do? We fill inanimate objects, things around us with human quality. Who can conspire? Who can decide to act together? It is people. But here it is the sun and the season of autumn who have conspired together to do what? To ripen everything, to bless and to load all the vines. And where are the vines growing? With a little imagination, my dear students, you should be able to imagine the hut, the thatched hut on which the creepers are growing. And what do you have on the creepers? You have all kinds of fruits. And how are the fruits? Not green in, green in color anymore. anymore. They have become golden in color because it is as if the autumn and the sun have decided to conspire to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells. Think of, a, think of a mango when it is green. It is small and gradually it grows bigger and bigger. You know, we use the word plump for somebody who is a little fat. So also the fruit becomes fat. What is becoming? The different fruits are swelling, are growing bigger and bigger. And with sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees. The bees come to the flowers. Now we are already talking about fruits. But Keats reminds us that even as fruits are growing on some of the trees, it looks as if some other plants are still having flowers. More and more flowers. For whom? For the bees. Because what will the bees do? The bees will take honey from the flowers to their hives. But look at the way Keats is describing it for us. He says they feel that there is no more place in their hives until they think warm days will never cease. The bees are worried. For how long will we keep collecting honey? It looks as if the warm days will never end for summer has overbrimmed their clammy cells. Sticky because of the honey. The cells are sticky and they are overbrimmed. You know, you have to imagine the scene of uh, water or water boiling, but better still, milk boiling. Because when milk boils, it boils over. You know, it comes out of the container. Now, it seems as if even in the hives, there is no more place for the honey. So the bees are worried. The bees now say, Summer, please stop. We don't want any more flowers because there's no more place for us to take our honey. So could you please stop having more flowers? Will you please allow winter to come? How long are you going to conspire? Look at Keats, how beautifully this young poet, this young romantic poet with his imagination talks of how autumn and the sun are conspiring with each other to load and bless all the vines that are growing over the thatch eaves. What are they doing? To swell the gourd, to make it plumper, to make sweeten each fruit right to the core. This is what summer and autumn together are doing. Can we look at this slide again? Can we look at the lines of the poem again? 
so that we read the lines to see whether we have understood it again. Let's look at the poem again, the same slide. Seasons of mist and mellow fruitfulness. Clues bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him. Who is the sun's conspiring? The autumn and the sun, right? Conspiring with him, how to load. Him is the sun and who is conspiring? Autumn. Conspiring with him, how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run. To bend with apples the most cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel. To set budding more and still more. He doesn't say flowering more, he says budding more because more buds, more flowers. To set budding more and still more, later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has overbrimmed their clammy cells. Think of the imagination of this great poet Keats. He is thinking of the hives of the bees, which are so full of honey, so sticky with honey, and the bees are worried because there is no more place. But if flowers blossom, if there is budding, if there is flowering, the bees are naturally attracted to the flowers. If they are attracted to the flowers, they collect the honey, they go back to their hives, but they find there is no place. So he is telling the sun and autumn, will you now stop? There has been too much. How beautifully he describes the autumn scene for us. And then we go on to an even more beautiful personification. Here autumn becomes a kind of representation of a woman. And what are the activities that this woman is involved in? He's talking about all the actions that are a part of autumn in England. My dear students, you will have to think of the different seasons in our country. What is it that your mom does? What is it that mommy is doing in summer? She's probably ensuring that there's all the masala ready, whether it's chili or turmeric. What does she do after that? She's making the pickle, the atan. You know, that is an activity that you associate with summer in Gujarat. So we've got different activities for different parts of the year, depending on the season, depending on what is growing. Maybe a little later in summer, your mom is probably collecting rust. And if you have a deep freeze in your house, she's probably putting into the fridge. So that is an activity that you associate with summer. Let us see the kinds of activities that are a part of autumn in England. Let us see how beautifully Keats describes it. But he does not describe it as activities of autumn. He thinks of a woman who is involved in these activities and therefore he is asking us questions. And remember, the figure of speech here, in addition to personification, is rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? A question for which no answer is required because the answer is so obvious. And therefore, he says, Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Oft is often. Thee is, you know, the old English for you. Hath is has. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Again, with a little imagination, please think of the season that is going to come in England after autumn. After autumn it is winter. Winter means snow. Winter means nothing will grow. Winter means that you cannot go out and collect your food. It means that in the season of autumn, you should ensure that you have collected enough food. And so, one of the activities that one associates with autumn is collection. So, the granary, the store, the go down. And therefore, he says, you are probably sitting at thy store. The go down, you know, where you are collecting all the food because you have to store it before the coming of winter. Because winter means snow and ice. Winter means nothing is growing in England. And remember, we are talking about an age much before the coming of the fridge, my dear students. And therefore, people would have to collect enough to ensure that they stock it before the arrival of winter. 
So one activity is the collection of food items. The second is granary flow, grain, you know the word. And many of you, if you've passed by any village or you live in a village or you've seen harvest, when you cut the maybe, maybe wheat, maybe rice, when that is cut, you remember it comes with the cover. I'm thinking of rice, okay? So when you've cut the rice, when you've harvested the rice, it is brought in. And then you have to beat it, remember? You could do it with a machine nowadays, but earlier it had to be beaten so that the husk, that is the cover of the rice, the cover of the rice comes out before it is ready. We are talking of danga and we are talking of it becoming choka. There is that period. And when is this happening in England? It's happening in autumn. So the granary flow where this threshing is taking place and there she is sitting. Who is she? Autumn. But he personifies autumn and he gives her the form of a woman. So she is sitting there carelessly on the granary flow. Thy hair soft lifted, soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Probably because of the breeze, you will have to have some imagination. Because of the threshing that is taking place, there is constant breeze. And if there is breeze, there is a little bit of the hair flying. He is imagining autumn in the form of a woman sitting there in the granary store and this threshing is taking place and because we are beating you know the paddy that has been brought in there is wind and because there is wind the hair here is probably flowing blowing because of the wind imagine you must have the imagination to appreciate keats's imagination not over there are other activities that we associate with autumn number one the store Number two, the granary where the threshing is taking place. Number three, or on a half-reaped furrow, sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. You will have to imagine that she is probably sitting there by a half-reaped furrow. We are collecting, harvesting is taking place. It's a long process. All that has to be cut and has to be brought to the granary. As she's doing it, she probably sits like this. And as she sits like this, she probably falls asleep. He's imagining this woman who is involved in the activities of autumn, autumn herself in the form of a woman. Use your imagination. She is probably tired and therefore she sits like this and she falls asleep. And the work is still to be done. She has to pick her swath and hit it so that the threshing process continues. But she has fallen asleep and therefore the next hit doesn't come. It is the activities of autumn that are being described here. And she is asleep. Why is she asleep? Drowsed with the fume of poppies. The poppy flower, you know, the seed from which we make afin, right? So it is something which works like a sedative something which puts you to sleep and sometimes there is some other work she is doing sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady the laden head across a brook or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours we are talking about an age when machinery had not yet come so everything that had to be done had to be done by the human hand. I am sure some of you might remember and maybe in some of our villages it is still being done. You might see that oil is not taken out in an oil mill. You might have seen the bullock go round and round, the chakki as we call it, for pressing to get out the oil from till or mustard or sunflower or whatever it is. This is a slow process, not as fast as so here we are talking about the cider press. Cider is the fruit, uh, is what is got from the apple fruit. You know, it's ale. It's a kind of wine which is very popular in England. It's a drink which is made from the apple fruit. So you will have to imagine how all the apple has been collected. They've been put together and you have the press, you know, something by which the juice is being extracted. Now this would be a slow process, my dear students and therefore drop by drop. We live in the world of machines and therefore it might be difficult for us to understand what Keats is talking about here.
But as I told you, if you can imagine the bullock which used to go round and round in our own country and maybe in some of our villages even today, it could be for water, it could be for oil in the chakki. You know, I'm talking about non-electric usage. If you can imagine that, you will be able to see what Keats is exactly describing. Drop by drop, the apple juice, the cider that he calls, is coming. Can we look at the slide again to see whether we have understood? Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy stove? Sometimes, whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting, careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, because of the winnowing there is a wind, or on a half reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed falling asleep with the fume, with the smell of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers, you have to hit, but you are not hitting. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Right? It goes on and on. It's a slow process. It's not an immediate two-minute thing. It will go on for hours. So very quickly, can you see what are the activities that he associates with autumn? Very quickly, you've got the store, you've got the granary, you've got the furrow, you've got the gleaner, you've got the uh, apple cider. All these are activities that one associates with the season of autumn in England. But what does Keats do in this poem, my dear students? He makes autumn, he personifies autumn, he gives her the role of a woman. So, it is as if Autumn is a woman who is sitting there supervising, participating in, watching, taking part in all the activities that one associates with Autumn. Are you able to see it? Are you able to experience the kind of imagination that Keats brings in? We have here, as I told you, a feast for the senses. He is talking about what we can see. He can talking about what we can touch. He's talking about what we can taste because remember, we are talking about honey. We are talking about the clammy cells. So all the senses do play a part for Keats. To me, or to many of us, if we were to be asked what is the best season, all of us have our favorite seasons. My favorite season is winter, but somebody might say spring. And many in England would never say winter because winter is a very, very cruel season in England. So, usually for the Englishmen, the most beautiful season is spring because you have to imagine how the earth springs back to life after winter. Everything is clothed in ice and snow. There is, there seems to be no nature alive. And suddenly, as the ice melts, once again, plants bloom. So, we think of spring as a beautiful season. And now I come to another sense, the sense of hearing. Where are the songs of spring? I, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom, the soft dying day and touch the stubble, stubble plains with rosy hue. Two senses here. One, the sense of hearing. Where are the songs of spring? Remember the swallows would start twittering. The robin redbreast would come again. The bees would be buzzing because the flowers are going to bloom. These are the songs of spring. Keats directly addresses autumn. Remember, I told you at the beginning of the poem that an ode is a direct address to something. Here it is to autumn. There it is to the nightingale. Somewhere it is to the Grecian urn. Remember? So here he tells autumn, don't worry about the songs of spring because thou hast thy music too. When do you have the music? While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue. Can you imagine a sunset? 
Can you imagine the clouds that you see in the sunset? Can you imagine the clouds blocking out some part of the sun? Can you imagine them seem like, seeming like bars? It is like that. So the plains, the stubble, after the fields have been, after the harvest has been done, you can imagine the scene in our country also, in any part of a country, in the fields of Gujarat, you can certainly imagine. The harvesting has been done, but you have not pulled out. That is, you are not yet ready for the next, for the next sowing. So it is all standing there after the harvest has been done. That is the stubble. The stubble plain has a rosy hue. So the color is a pinkish color. There is music then. What kind of a music? Then in a wailful choir, the small gnats moan among the river sallows, borne aloft are sinking as the light wind lives or dies. Here he is talking about the gnat. G-N-A-T, gnat, is a kind of insect which makes a buzzing sound. Like the bee, like the bumblebee, you know, onomatopoeia, zzz, that kind of a sound. So the gnats are, have their own song. That is the song of autumn. And when do we they see this song? When the rosy hue hits the stubble plains, when the barred clouds are seen across the sun. Then you hear this. <coughs> and how loud is it? How soft is it? It depends on the wind. Because if there is a lot of wind, then the sound gets carried. If there is no wind, then the sound does not carry it. Is that the only sound? No, says Keats. There are other sounds too. And full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly bone. You know the lambs, the little sheep, they have been born. Now they are fully grown and they bleat. My dear students, you know that we have different words to describe the sounds of different animals. Like we talk of the barking of the dogs. <coughs> we talk of the bleating of the lambs. So the second sound, music, that autumn has is the bleating from the hilly bone. There's another sound. <coughs> There's another song. Hedge crickets sing. The cricket, right? The tamru, which we have in Gujarat also. The hedge crickets sing, and now we treble soft. The red breast whistles. The robin red breast has already come. So you've got the robin red breast. It's still there because it's not yet winter. And gathering swallows twitter. Look at the words that he uses to describe the music. Okay? So for the gnats you have the moan. For the lambs you have the bleat. For the crickets you have the singing. For the red breast you have the whistling. And for the swallows you have the twitter. This is the music that Autumn has. So he tells Autumn, why are you worried? Why are you thinking of the songs of spring? It's not only spring that has music, you have your own music too. You have your own beauty too. You have your own activities too. He is addressing autumn. He sees autumn, the season of autumn, as a season of mellow missfulness. He sees it as a season of fruits. He sees it as a season where autumn and sun conspire to swell the goat, to ripen everything to the core. He looks at the different activities, the granary, the store, the winnowing, the cider press. And then he talks about the songs of spring. It's very interesting, my dear students, to remember and to note, I just want to draw your attention, that Keats has mentioned all this in a letter that he wrote to a friend. Keats's letters very often give us very interesting information about the poems that he wrote. When he wrote the nightingale, he talks about how he heard a nightingale. When he's writing the poem to Autumn, he talks about the wonderful season. This is a letter that he wrote to a friend. I'm just drawing your attention to some of the words. A grand day, wonderful season, better than the chilly green of spring. <coughs> All this was written in a letter to his friend Reynolds on 21st September 1819 and this is the description that we see. What are the qualities that we see here in an ode to autumn? Number one, it is about human experience. Number two, it is rich in detail. Right from the first line, 
the mellowness, the plumpness, the core, ripening to the core, blessing and loading, the vines and the thatch eaves. He goes on and on. There's detail. There's elegant writing. It's beautiful writing. The movement is almost musical. We don't have to stop anywhere. It seems as if it's flexible. What is it that he uses? It is the iambic pentameter. Some of you, my dear students, in a later semester, will be studying about it in your prosody. But here, enough to say that each line has 10 syllables. Remember, we have talked about syllables in another class. And therefore, you know that a pentameter is 5 meters and an am has 2 syllables. So 2 into 5 makes it 10. The sound and sense go together so beautifully. There is meaning, but there is also sound. This ability to create the sound. See, you choose a word because of the meaning that it conveys. The poet chooses the word also because of the sound that the word has. And this sometimes gives rise to a figure of speech which we call onomatopoeia. It also gives rise to figures of speech like alliteration. It gives rise to assonance. It gives rise to euphony. These are figures of speech that you will be studying or have already studied in your paper number 213. So, there is a good combination of sound and sense. I want to talk about a word, a phrase which Keats himself used and that is negative capability. Maybe your teachers have talked to you in some other context, but in the context of Keats's poems, it's very important to remember what he means by this. Keats says that in order to understand and to appreciate the experience of what a sparrow experiences, for example, I'm a human being. How do I know what a sparrow feels? So Keats says you should have the ability to at the gravel with the sparrow. That means you should be able to go onto the ground and pick at the gravel. You should be able to do that. Only if you are able to do that can you really write about the experience of the swallow. This is what Keats says. And this negative capability is there in all Keats's great poems. Keats is able to remove himself out of himself and move into the character the scene that he is describing. I would say that in this poem, it's almost as if Keats is the woman who is being personified. Autumn, who is being personified, is Keats himself. It's almost as if he's sitting on the granary floor. It's almost as if he can see the cider press. It's almost as if he can hear the swallows twitter. It's almost as if he can hear the red breast whistle or the lambs bleat or the gnats moan, or the crickets sing, all that. So what do we have here, my dear students? We have Keats at his best. We have Keats, the great romantic poet. We have Keats who shows his subjectivity, his imagination, his ability to give importance to all the senses. He is a sensuous poem, poet, remember? All the senses were equally important and we see that in all his great odes, there is a musical quality to the poem. Who would imagine that this great poet lived only for 26 years? What if he had lived longer? Maybe he would have written many, many better poems. But as far as we are concerned, this one great ode or the five great odes that he wrote are proof enough of the greatness of Keats as a poet. Remember, we are looking at the Romantic Age, the age which began in 1798 and ended at 1832, when begins the Victorian Age in English literature. Remember that you already know the characteristic features of the Romantic Age. You have looked at some of the important writers, some novelists, some essays, some poets.
and to give you some idea of the representative poetry of this age, we have looked at poems by Wordsworth, by Shelley, by Byron, and in this lecture, a poem by Keats, Ode to Autumn. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed and understood this fabulous ode, Ode to Autumn, by John Keats, the great romantic poet. Thank you very much. Sandhan, all Gujarat integrated classroom. Satellite na madhyam thi jodh thi kadi, itle Sandhan.